Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our third out of five talks about integrity. We'll be looking at the mammalian experience today. How the mammalian body has the capacity to feel strong internal sensations that inform us about biological and social situations. These feelings contribute to what we call emotions. At their best, they guide us in our interactions and help us make good decisions that serve ourselves and others. But as we all know, feelings and emotions can also run amok, leading to problems between people, lots of strife and conflict and unhappiness. Fortunately, in this era, we know a lot about mindfulness and how it can help us learn to regulate our emotions and use them to advantage. So this will be a brief discussion of certain aspects of what we know and how we can apply it. I hope you find it helpful. Let's begin. So our topic, as it has been, is integrity. And I'm going to continue to talk about it as arising from these two qualities that complement one another, separation and connection. And this isn't surprising, I don't think, but it does give a nice framework, particularly today when we'll be talking some about emotions. So we're, we're going to talk today about the mammalian body, so to speak. And this is really the animal experience of feeling hunger and thirst and pleasure and pain and being able to move through the environment and manipulate things and make decisions and interact, etc. So there's a lot of feeling involved with the mammalian experience. And there are feelings that arise in the body cavity, in the chest and belly, that give us information about our biological and social experiences. So for instance, we could have a feeling of heated combativeness that might arise and motivate us to protect ourselves or our loved ones from threats. And we might have feelings of openness and warmth that would motivate us to invite people to interact in friendly ways. In other words, the feelings can motivate separation or connection. Now, I mentioned in the first talk of the term that as a child who came of age in the hippie era, I internalized the idea that connection is the highest good and really learned to believe that love is all we need and we can live together in harmony. And that continues to be important to me. In actual fact, I struggle, though, with social connection because of the various traumas in my upbringing and how they affected me. My personality has tended to be pretty defended, and it's not easy for me to feel comfortable around others and to connect. But I do still aspire for it, and I still believe that it is the direction that we as a species need to go if we want to solve some of the problems that seem to face our society. But it's important not to be naive around this. Obviously, there are forms of connection that are not desirable. This water buffalo does not want this type of connection with these two lions. And we can think of many humans that we would prefer not to have any connection with because they would harm us. So there's clearly a need for separation. Here we're looking at a different water buffalo, a large bull, facing down these two lions. And I assume that the bull has in its body cavity a feeling of heated combativeness and is communicating a warning to the lions, suggesting that if they try to attack, it may not go well for them. That kind of interior feeling that motivates us to maintain separation when necessary 
is quite adaptive and does serve our integrity, biological integrity. It protects us. So these feelings are serving a function that supports the thriving and development of our lives. In the best case, we're able to use the information that they provide to make wise decisions about who to interact with and in what ways. But I think it's clear that it doesn't always go that well, that sometimes our feelings feel chaotic, disorganized, and they motivate reactions that actually work counter to our integrity and our best interests. An example would be a person who stays in an unhealthy relationship because of feelings of dependency or insecurity or a misplaced need to take care of somebody. A decision is made to ignore the danger and stay connected in spite of it. Alternatively, someone might feel very defended, as I just mentioned, I often do, and subtly or or not so subtly push people away who might actually be supportive and helpful. Now, I think that kind of counterproductive behavior is more common in people that suffered a lot of early life trauma, that are perhaps highly sensitive, uh, etc. And there's good evidence in the research base to support that belief. But it seems clear to me, observing others, that even people that are you know, not so traumatized and not so sensitive still have times where their feelings cause problems for them. They don't serve integrity, they run counter to it. So I want to use this talk to look at this process. I think it's a very important one both because our feelings have such an important impact on our lives and also because we can do something about them through meditation. So I've brought in here the objective body that we talked about last time and our very powerful human capacity to separate ourselves, as it were, from our bodily experience and observe it as if from a distance. This allows us to make decisions about what we're feeling. So the feelings are arising from the body core, by and large, somewhere between the jaws and the groin. So we have language about having an open heart or a hard heart or butterflies in our stomach or clenching in our gut. These phrases that we use fairly commonly about feelings point to an important truth that they arise experientially from the body core. In a sense, it's the body giving us information about our biological and social circumstance through, these, through this language of feeling. Of course, we also have the human mind with its verbal thoughts that also provides information based on past experience and analysis, and etc. So these are really powerful sources of information, thoughts and feelings. One way of looking at emotions is to see them as being a combination of conceptual ideas and felt sensations in the body core. The general idea is that we've got this valuable information and it comes together in what we call our emotions. And used properly, our emotions can help us navigate a complex biological and social landscape in skillful ways. That would be the ideal. But things aren't always ideal, clearly. And it's quite possible, as I've said in earlier talks, for thoughts and feelings to get locked into a kind of unhealthy spiral. So a simple and not uncommon example would be somebody says something to me that sort of takes me aback. And they walk away and I think about what they said and I begin to suspect that it was meant as an insult. And as soon as I think that thought, a feeling tone arises in my body core 
that makes me feel wounded. And that uncomfortable feeling then provides a kind of filter that affects how I continue to think. And I'm more likely to follow the pathway down the idea that this was an insult, that person meant to hurt me, they don't like me, I did, you know, they think I did something to them, or they're trying to attack me for some reason. And the more I think along those lines, the worse I start to feel inside and the worse my thinking becomes. And, and pretty soon I'm caught in exactly that kind of chaotic situation where my reactions may not serve my integrity. Now, we, of course, want to break these cycles when we can, right? We want to break the vicious cycle and react in more skillful ways. One way to begin to improve our capacity to manage all this is to leverage our ability to separate our human self-aware consciousness from the feeling tone in the body core to look at things with a bit more of a scientific and detached eye. So one thing we can think about is what it really means to be a mammal. Okay, this is something I've brought up in prior talks. Biologists, as everyone probably knows, define mammals as organisms that are warm-blooded, which is to say they maintain a constant body temperature. They have coverings of fur or hair. They develop in what we call the uterus or womb, and they're nourished by milk. So here's a fairly characteristic picture of mammalian life. We've got the mother cat with her kittens recently emerged from the womb, lapping up milk, snuggling into her warm and furry body. And we can imagine that there's a lot of internal feelings in the kittens, but also, especially in the mother, who is likely to be purring and feeling affection and protection, etc. Okay, so these are feelings we can identify with because we also are mammals and have all of this experience, both in our past and in our present. Warmth and connection and nourishment and support. Of course, feelings also can provide warnings. They don't always indicate safety, they sometimes indicate threat. And here we see a little cat with evident alarm looking at this giant dog looming overhead. And the feeling tone, of course, is going to be quite different in this case because the situation is different. It's going to be more unpleasant and a lot of energy in the system. So whereas the mother cat is feeling pleasant and relaxed, this cat is feeling unpleasant and charged. Now, it should be clear then that feelings can motivate and drive behavior in organisms that aren't capable of language and thought. So we're looking at the two children on the right. The older of the two is probably pretty well developed in her language skills. The younger one may just be capable of a few short phrases and words, but neither one of them is probably thinking how, oh, it's very nice to offer food to this person I care about. It's a spontaneous act of sharing that comes directly from the feelings without a lot of conceptual analysis or overlay. It's just not necessary. So this feeling ability is part of being a mammal, and it stays with us even as we grow up and become adults. So the picture on the left is of a gathering of people where someone fell suddenly ill and what we see is a gentleman who's leaning over the stricken one. Probably he's a physician or somebody with some background and he's assessing what's going on. Now, no doubt there are feeling tones in his body core. He feels concern and empathy watching this person who is in distress. But in addition to the mammalian feelings, there's now this human language and thought that's undoubtedly running through his mind. And if I'm correct that he's a physician, he's evaluating this person as a patient, making a decision about what's really going on here and what needs to be done. If his conclusion is, well, this is just a little bit of overheated, mild uh, heat stroke, this person just needs to rest in the shade and drink some water and everything will be fine, then the emotion, which is to say the combination of thought and feelings, is likely to be one of relief. 
On the other hand, if he concludes that this could be a serious heart condition and that life may be threatened, his emotion is likely to be much more something like alarm. And so the feeling tone in the body, the raw feeling of having discomfort in the body cavity is fairly undifferentiated and it takes on a more specific meaning as we conceptualize. This is the idea. And it's an idea that I learned from this book by Lisa Feldman Barrett, How Emotions Are Made the Secret Life of the Brain. So she's a psychologist and an emotion researcher, and she's proposed a view of emotion which challenges some of the long-standing views in the field. Not everybody agrees with her ways of framing things, but her opinions are, I believe, respected, and they seem to me uh, quite useful for us as meditators as we try to work with this complex experience of having feelings and thoughts and emotions and social interactions and so on. So the idea that she's putting forward is that, yes, emotions are somehow or another a combination of thought and feeling. And from her standpoint, she believes that the feelings in our body core are really of only four different types, depending on where they land on two different axes. So the experience in the body core can be one of having very high energy or very low energy, and it can be either pleasant or unpleasant. And that's about it for what we're actually feeling if we're honest with ourselves. You know, the raw feeling is, is fairly undifferentiated, according to Dr. Barrett. So an example of a high energy, unpleasant experience would be anger. Okay. Now, some people probably enjoy anger, but many of us find it unpleasant, and it certainly doesn't lead to contentment. And the anger is going to be the result of some situation in most cases. So an example that I could think of is driving along the freeway in the right-hand lane, and there's someone entering on an on-ramp to my right, and they suddenly swerve into my space right in front of me in a kind of aggressive way. They don't you know, slow down to let me pass or speed up to fit in better, and I have to swerve. And all of a sudden, I, I feel very energized, and it's you know quite unpleasant. And I'm quite likely to feel anger, especially if I think it was deliberate. But I could be in a rather similar situation, driving along the freeway in the right-hand lane, and a large deer could run into the road, and I'd have to swerve to avoid it. And again, I'd have a sense of you know suddenly feeling very energized, and it would be a sort of unpleasant experience. But the emotion would probably be something I'd call more like fear. I mean, I'm not going to get angry at the deer. It doesn't know any better. So the interior raw feeling is not much different, but the emotion is actually quite different because of the different situation. And we could go through this in the other four quadrants. You know, a low energy, unpleasant, raw feeling can feel like sorrow if we've just lost a dear uh, friend but it could feel more like discouragement if we just had something we'd been working on for many years, a project uh, that, that just was clearly not going to succeed. And we could do the same you know, with high energy pleasant quadrant. We can think of joy when we're just you know, simply happy, but also we could think of sexual desire if we think back to some time when we've met someone and there's like a very high energy, very pleasant situation, but with a particular focus on this romantic uh, possibility and so on. Low energy, pleasant might be contentment, or it could be something more like just restful. So the idea here again is that we have fairly undifferentiated feelings in the body core, and then we frame them according to what we're experiencing in our past history, and that's what develops into these more complex emotional uh, states. So there is this potential for all of this to get pretty chaotic and, and not serve us very well. But there's also the potential to get better at it. And again, how much work we need to do on this is going to vary. You know, some people seem to be naturally quite skillful at this. Uh, they were raised with people that had good skills, they had a lot of support and safety growing up or whatever it is, or they just had a, you know, genes that allow them to manage all this quite easily. Other people, and again, I'm you know, in the second category, uh, didn't come into the world with all that skill and have to acquire it later. 
And again, this is a class about mindfulness, and so how do we use mindfulness in this context? And I would say that we can look at mindfulness for today as consisting of two different styles. You know, one is a more separating form of mindfulness. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean, we can use this ability of our human minds to create a sense of distance from our feelings. And that can feel kind of protective. So we can watch what's happening in our body core with this sense of being a little bit removed from it. And that can slow things down and give us a little more space to decide you know, what's really happening and what's the best course of action. And we could call this a kind of witnessing mindfulness. We're witnessing our feelings without reacting to them. But we're witnessing them with a kind of separation. As we observe the feelings in our body core from this space of witnessing, we can investigate how appropriate they are to the current moment and the current situation. Often our feelings have more to do with what happened long ago, even in childhood, than what's happening right now. And recognizing this can be very helpful when we want to learn to respond more skillfully in the moment. But there's another approach. If the witnessing mindfulness is about backing away from the feelings, a more connected form of mindfulness would be, as it were, leaning into them. So we would lower our awareness, move it down from the head into the heart and the belly, the body cavity, and feel directly whatever raw feeling tone is available there. So here we're not trying to get away from or diminish or talk ourselves out of whatever painful feeling might be arising. We're simply present for it. We can call this immersive mindfulness, okay? So we're immersing ourselves in the feelings. We're moving into them, not away. You know, this has to be done a little bit gently and carefully because if the feelings are quite strong, they can feel overwhelming and maybe even a bit punishing. And so we want to be judicious and move toward the feelings and settle into them as long as it feels within our easy capacity to manage and tolerate. And then if we need a little more space, we can take that more distant witnessing perspective. Or we could move our attention into a neutral part of the body like the hands. As we grow more familiar with the feelings in our body core, we will become more knowledgeable about our deeper values and our inner wisdom. We'll learn to trust what our body is saying about circumstances, people, and decisions. We could look at this from a neuroanatomic perspective. So I think we're all aware from popular reading and maybe from the courses that I'm offering and other sources that in the front of the brain, behind the forehead, is this region called the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for executive decision making and abstract thought and language functions and so on. It's not that they're all packed in that region, but it's one of the main roles of the prefrontal cortex is to manage all these higher level cognitive processes. In contrast, we also have the limbic system, which is further back and sort of deep in the middle of the brain. And that's where the feeling tone and the biological drive states are managed. And when we practice a witnessing style of mindfulness, we're exaggerating the separation between these two so that we can use our executive oversight to look at our feelings as if from a distance and get a little space from them while we make decisions about what to do. Alternatively, we can notice that in addition to being somewhat separate anatomically, the two areas are also densely connected. So the fine colorful fibers we see here are representations of the brain tracks in an actual brain. This is a, a certain type of neural imaging. And it shows that between the front of the brain and the limbic system, there are dense fibers that connect the two. So they are perfectly capable of connecting. And so we can practice that immersive form of mindfulness by allowing our awareness to flow back into the limbic system. 
So we have these two styles of mindfulness, the so-called witnessing and the immersive. And by practicing them in a balanced way, going back and forth, moment by moment, according to how much direct contact with the feelings we can tolerate or how much distance we feel would be helpful, we can gradually gain the kind of skill and wisdom that allows us to use the information that our feelings and our thoughts and our emotions provide in ways that serve, after all, integrity. And so the whole point of having a mammalian body with all these feelings is to survive and to perpetuate the species. And so we have all of these capacities precisely because they have served us in evolutionary time. And one of the issues that we face in the present day is that our current environment is so different from the one we evolved in and so some of our automatic reactions don't work as well as they used to. And so we have to really make some effort to manage the feelings and the thoughts and the emotions. But fortunately, we have a very adaptable human consciousness and, and we can, in fact, learn and gain skill. And this is one place where meditation is really key because learning to react in skillful ways that serve integrity is something that isn't about having the right ideas. It's really about having the capacity to slow things down and sort things out and make decisions based on all the information at hand and not acting impulsively. The advantage of the biology in this instance is that it gives us some ways to start to experience our interior and all of the stuff that can sometimes seem chaotic and find ways to see a path through it, to navigate in order to use all this valuable information to serve our own well-being and the well-being of those around us.